Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome to Before the Lights Podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Let's get this show started. Go grab your coffee or get a drink, whatever tickles your fancy at this time of day you're listening to the show. And then tell your family, friends, neighbors, and strangers about the show. Today, we have a New York City crime author, a veteran city reporter with the New York Daily News. He's been at this over 35 years. A two-time Associated Press New York State Staffer of the Year. He has published Cops Under Fire, Chin, Life and Times of Mafia Boss, Vincent Giganti, and Last Don Standing. Please welcome to the show, Larry McShane. Larry, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, Tommy. I appreciate it. I am excited to have you on the show. You were born in Inwood, top of Manhattan, and then as a child moved to New Jersey. Why did you guys go from New York to New Jersey? It's an easy one. Irish triplets. <laughs> <laughs> three kids Three kids in four years. Uh, our apartment got a little too crowded up in Inwood, so we moved across the river. So you are part of a triplet. I'm the eldest. Okay. All right. Yeah. That is fantastic. When, why, how did your love of writing and reporting come from? It really came from, from reading the, the New York Daily News, where I eventually wound up working. Um, you know, even though we moved to New Jersey, you know, my parents were New Yorkers. They had grown up in New York, uh, in Manhattan specifically. And my father would bring home a copy of the Daily News uh, every night. And, you know, I don't know, from the time I was six or seven years old, I would uh, grab the paper from him, you know, and spread it out on the living room. Tabloid, much easier for a youngster to read than, you know, a, a bigger paper. And I especially, you know, love the sports section. I'm a big sports fan. I'm a giant season ticket holder. Um, not this year, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I think that's where, you know, my interest was first peaked as a kid, just reading the paper. Same thing. Is that how the attraction to the mob came or did that come later on in your life? That Well, I mean, it, it, there was a little bit of it. I didn't quite grasp it, but... Uh, it was intriguing to read these stories about, you know, Three Finger Brown or, you know, the, the nicknames were always great. And, uh, you know, especially back then, uh, there was a lot of mob stuff going on. You know, I, I sort of missed the Frank Costello era, you know, but Carlo Gambino was still around. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of interesting names. I didn't know who they were but I found it kind of intriguing. You're a Seton Hall graduate. Why did you choose to go to Seton Hall? Uh, my a buddy of mine from college was going there. So <laughs> uh, I had applied to some other schools, but then he got in there and uh, they said we could room together. So uh, I wound up at Seton Hall, but I'm glad I went there. Uh, you know, I still have a lot of ties with the school now. I'm a season ticket holder for the basketball program. Uh, I do some mentoring of, uh, of kids who are there now. So, uh, you know, maybe not the best reason to go there, but it turned out to be a good decision. How long have you been a season ticket holder for hoops? 1985. What's that? 35 years. Wow. You've, you've seen some yeah. good times and bad teams with that program. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was a long stretch there. It was not good, but uh, <laughs> lately with coach Willard, we're doing much better. In 1980, you joined the Associated Press, and I understand, did you start out actually doing some baseball dictation then? Yeah, I, you know, this is obviously way, way, way pre-internet, and the way the stories were filed were there'd be a reporter at the ballpark, wherever that would be, from coast to coast, and the reporter would call our desk, the dictationist desk, and he would dictate a story. He would just, you know, off the top of his head you know, whatever, Catfish Hunter threw a three-pitch shutout or three-hit shutout and Bobby Mercer homered and the Yankees win. And so that was my first job, taking uh, dictationists of game stories. And then we would do the box score as well. He would dictate the box score. It was, uh, it was a good start to the business because it was very, very fast-paced. Everything had to be done quickly. And it kind of instilled in me the idea that, you know, things need to move, you know? Yeah, 
You spent one year in 1983 in Baltimore. I want to jump to 1985. I understand you have a pretty good story about the night that Paul Castellano was murdered outside of Spark Steakhouse. Yeah, I'm, I'm working, I think, a noon to eight shift. Um, our offices were in Rockefeller Center. And uh, again, we're like going in the way back machine. The police department used to send out not really crime tips, but if there was something that they thought would be interesting to the media, homicides mostly, via fax machine. Mm. So we get a fax saying that uh, two guys have been shot uh, outside Spark Steakhouse at like maybe 5.30 at night. So, uh, you know, obviously it's an odd location. Two guys are dead. And uh, quickly we get word that it's it's Paul Castellano, the head of the... Uh, of the Gambino family. So they send me over and I run, you know, the five, six blocks to get over there. And when I got there, the, you know, the cops were already on the scene, but it, it was really bizarre because they had huge Klieg lights lighting up the whole street. Mm. And so it, it looked like a movie set, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but it wasn't any movie set, you know, and the two bodies were out in the street. And uh, the cops were all over the place. Uh, and at first, nobody would confirm it. But then uh, another reporter and I spotted Jim Fox, who was the head of the New York FBI at the time. And and Jim said, yeah, that's him. So then I had to run to a payphone, you know, no cell phones, <laughs> and call the office and, and dump my notes. And, uh, yeah, I think more than anything, that one experience kind of – professionally at least got me interested in, in the mob stuff. And it was a great time for it. You know, the commission trial was coming up uh, without Castellano as a defendant, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, Chin Gigante was kind of rising in the Genovese family. Uh, you know, there would be the Colombo family war upcoming and there was just a lot of stuff. And the other thing that was interesting is, uh, you know, at the time, Rudy Giuliani, was the U S attorney in Manhattan. He was prosecuting a lot of these cases and, uh, you know, he really enjoyed the attention in the limelight. And, uh, so it was kind of a perfect storm for a reporter, you know, you're the one that so, broke the story for the AP. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> I didn't do much except run, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, sometimes you just got to be the first there. How, as long as yeah. you're not, you don't have to be the quickest, as long as you're not the yeah. last guy. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I also understand, Larry, you had an incident one time. I'm, I'm not sure where it was. I was doing some research on your background. Were you at a location or in a restroom and turned around and saw Gotti? <laughs> yes. Uh, there was a pending indictment against uh, John Gotti and his brother, Gene, in Brooklyn Federal Court across the river from Manhattan. And uh, so I went out to cover a couple of days of it. You know, it was a big story, obviously. At that post point, Gotti had, had ascended to uh, to boss of the family. And so there's a break, and I went into the men's room down the hall from uh, from the courtroom. And the door opens, and I don't think anything of it. And uh, I turn around, and there's John and Gene. And uh, they don't say anything, but the look makes it clear that, you know, I need to finish and get out of there quickly. <laughs> you uh, weren't which, welcome which there did. anymore. Yeah, exactly. You know, this was like their boardroom, I guess, for, for the duration of the trial. Uh, so, yeah, that was my brush with the Gotti brothers. That's a good one. That, not every Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, you bet. 1997, um, I understand. Did you cover some of the trial with Sammy the Bull Gravano? In 97, I covered Sammy Gravano's testimony. Okay against uh chin giganti at that point sammy had already pleaded out he had flipped and become a government witness and if memory serves me by the time he came into brooklyn to testify against uh, giganti his testimony had already convicted like three dozen other people including of course you know his old boss john Gotti and uh lacasio the family's uh consigliere so man uh, was it was that uh, was it a tense courtroom and or was it was there a lot of people allowed in or not? Well, I had to get there early. Um, you know, they, they're, there's in-house press, people who cover the courthouse all the time. They're guaranteed seats. Otherwise, you were not. So I had to, you know, I'm coming from New Jersey at this point, you know, 
New Jersey to Manhattan to Brooklyn, up from the subway and over to the courthouse. Uh, so yeah, it was it was packed, and uh, sort of the big thing at this point was uh, Gravano's book had come out, mm. and so for the first time, a defense attorney was able to question Gravano about things unflattering things that were in the book, you know, stuff that would help sell the book and stir interest. Um, but stuff that had not been known to previous defense attorneys. I mean, the biggest thing, of course, was that he, it, God, he got a, six figures anyway for the book, a, like a lot of money for the book. So that became a big issue at trial. And uh, Gravano didn't comport himself as well as he had it at some of the previous trials when this stuff wasn't there to be cross-examined on. We're going to start into some of the publications you have. In 1999, you got the book Cops Under Fire. It's the reign and terror against hero cops. I'm going to put links in the show notes to all three publications. So listeners, if you want to get your hands on these, there'll be links for those in the show notes as well. But Larry, how does this relate to what's happening today? Well, the concept of this book, I, I should start out by saying I had covered a trial of a an undercover narcotics detective in Brooklyn who uh, with a bit of finagling by prosecutors was brought up on charges, uh, which he eventually beat. Uh, but it was kind of a Pyrrhic victory at the end of it. He was assigned to work in like a, a toe pound in Brooklyn. This guy was a highly decorated undercover narcotics cop. So I covered that trial and, uh, when it was all over, I met with this guy, Zach Zari is his name, and, and his lawyer. I did a big piece for the AP. And I guess somebody, a book publisher, saw this, and they had an idea that, you know, we could find seven or eight of these cases and, and do a book about it. So that was kind of the starting point. Um, they had a couple of cases that they wanted me to look into. Uh, I had the Zari case, and there was another case of uh, – as I said, I'm in New Jersey. There was another case of a cop in Newark who was trying to arrest a drug suspect. She's fighting him. He gets her into the back of the car. And as he's climbing in the front of the car, she throws the car in reverse and starts dragging him down the street. He fires a shot uh, and kills her. Uh, and he he became embroiled in like a whole thing. You know, they were trying to fire him. He wound up fighting it. And I think he got a maybe like a three month suspension, but they were supposed to be, the idea was there would be cases like this where, uh, you know, a cop, a well-respected cop, a guy with a good record ends up on the other side of the law. And what, what happens from there? Also in this book, is there some animosity then towards law enforcement that we're kind of seeing what's happening in the world today? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think it's different in that, these cases that I wrote about seem to be people being singled out. Okay. Whereas there seems to be a broader brush now, you know? Yeah. Right. It's almost like we're looking at issues through different lenses as time evolves. Sure. Cultural changes. Yeah. And, you know, exactly right. Yeah. And I, and I always have said that I think a lot of problems that we face in the world today, that if, if people would take ownership of what's happening or to them Instead of trying to not take ownership, we could alleviate some things, but I think that's easier said than done. Yeah, so much is, right? <laughs> yeah. In 2005, you were the winner of the New York Press Club's Feature Story of the Year. What, what was that story, Larry? Uh, I didn't prepare for this question, but I remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did a story about the lawsuits that are brought every year against New York City. Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of lawsuits and my story focused on some of the more absurd ones you know people who were trying to pull a bit of a scam on the city uh you know slip and falls there were a couple of those and so yeah the idea was i spoke to um in new york city the corporation council is the city's lawyer so i spoke to several i spoke to the current and several past uh people who held that position and was able to kind of pick their brains to get, you know, some representative cases of, you know, kind of how crazy it is to be the lawyer for a city of 8 million people. It's a good one. 
2007, yeah. you get with the Daily News. You've covered nine Olympics. And did you also cover 9-11? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what- 9-11 and uh, 1993 when the uh, bomb was detonated by the terrorists underneath the Trade Center in the parking garage. I did both of them. Yeah, 9-11. God, I don't know when I had a day off after that. But, yes, I was uh, – I mean, I could just give you the short version. I was on the bus coming to work, coming down the uh, entry ramp into the Lincoln Tunnel uh, when the first plane hit. And then I guess the second plane hit and somebody on the bus got a phone call. And that's that's how those of us riding the bus, the commuters sort of learned that It sounds like this is everybody thought initially maybe just a small plane that hit the World Trade Center, you know. But when the second plane hit, it became obvious that there was a lot more going on than that. Um, And so we were one of the last buses to get into the city. And I got to work probably about 930. And I think I was there till about two in the morning. So they put you out on location or just stay in in? In the office, I was the uh, I was the main rewrite, so I was in the office taking feeds from everybody else. It's, uh, I mean, the thing I remember most is at the end of the day, I was coming back back home, uh, but the bus terminal was shut down and Penn Station was shut down. But the path trains, which is like a small rail line between uh, Manhattan and, and New Jersey, were open, and I could take the path train to uh, Hoboken which is, of course, right across the river from Ground Zero. And uh, when I got off the train, you know, I'd been seeing this on TV all day, um, but I wanted to actually see it. So I walked out of the train station in in Hoboken and out to the banks of uh, on the Jersey side of the Hudson River. And it was just, uh, you know, to see it that close and, uh, you know, seeing it on TV could not in any way, shape or form express like how devastating it looked and you know they had the klieg lights as well and the flames were still burning and there were people all over the place it was uh yeah it was was a day and a night that uh, i'll never forget i'm sure you interviewed over 40 members of the rock and roll hall of fame which i think is fantastic (laughs) including three of the four tops and the ramones any story from that sticks out in your mind from interviewing some of these guys these people in the rock and roll hall of fame uh, I interviewed the guys from the Four Tops uh, in the morning at a hotel in in Manhattan, and a Duke Fakir, I believe, is the guy's name, came down for coffee, and he put a little whiskey in his coffee. He said it's good for the voice. So <laughs> <laughs> that one I remember. Um, you know, I, I interviewed Springsteen uh, in Asbury Park at, at Convention Hall there, so that was kind of cool. Uh, I almost forgot. The, the best story is the Keith Richards story, of, of course. So I go to meet Keith Richards at a hotel on the Upper East Side. And uh, he's running late. So I'm sitting in the lobby and finally they give me the go ahead. And usually there's a whole thing of like, you know, some publicist escorts you up and sets everything up. There's none of that. They just tell me, go up to this room. So I go up to the room and I knock on the door And uh, he answers the door himself, like, come on in, mate. And uh, he sort of gestures broadly to uh, to his right. And uh, there's a huge bar there, fully stocked bar there. And he goes, EMG, man. And I said, EMG, I I don't know what you mean. And he says, everything must go. (laughs) (laughs) So, so, I mean, it was kind of great. You know, I grabbed a Heineken. He was drinking... I think vodka and orange juice he had. It was funny. He had two coasters and two ashtrays so that whatever hand he had the drink in, the cigarette could go in the other and vice versa. You know what I mean? And he was a great interview. Really, really great. That's great to hear. Let's start talking about Chin. 2016, the life and times of mafia boss, Vincent Giganti. He was also known as the odd father. And that's the first question out of my mind is why was he nicknamed the odd father for our listeners who may not know who he is. Yeah. He was nicknamed the odd father because he avoided prison for God, three decades, close to three decades anyway, by pretending to be uh, mentally ill. Um, 
So is he yeah, really he crazy did. or is he pretending? Definitely pretending. And in the end, when he, you know, he was convicted at trial and then later on he took a, a plea, he pleaded out. He admitted at the second trial that the whole thing was a ruse. But I mean, there were he went through elaborate steps to do this. You know, he lived in Greenwich Village, uh, right across from the social club that was his headquarters. And he could be seen uh, walking down Sullivan Street, uh, talking to parking meters, uh, urinating in public. Uh, his typical outfit was pajamas, a bathrobe, and uh, and a wool cap. Um, and and that was his public thing, you know. He that's how he went out. But the FBI came to arrest him one time. <laughs> he he was living with his mother. And uh, they found him in the bathtub with the water running, the shower running, and holding an open umbrella. Uh, <laughs> so he, he went to great lengths to, to perpetuate this whole thing. IQ wise is up there to think of these things to go, I can throw them off by doing X, Y, and Z. Well, I mean, that's the thing that's so great about it. You know what I mean? How do you that they would put him in with psychiatrist after psychiatrist after psychiatrist. Um, you know, I think he got indicted in 1990 and it took seven years for the federal government to find psychiatrists that would say, yes, 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 he is sane, you know? Um, but he had a lot of time and a lot of practice at it. And, uh, like any good actor, he did not break character, you know, was he is ruthless and is, a killer as people have made him out to be? Well, I mean, the story was that you were not allowed to say his name in public. You know, if you wanted to refer to him, you did this, touch your chin. Uh, and, you know, he, he had let people know that if, if you say my name aloud, I'll have you killed. Now, he also, he was very adamantly against the drug trade. Um, and there were a couple of members of, of John Gotti's crew who he, uh, who he killed for violating the ban on, on drug sales. Um, so yeah, he, you know, he was a pretty ruthless and cold blooded. He's, he's an old school guy. You know, he came of age in the 1950s, you know, um, Vito Genovese was, was running the family and, uh, that was his mentor. Uh, another guy from Greenwich Village. And so that's that's the guy that he learned at the feet of. So he learned the the old way. Was his rise to power then when uh, Vito Genovese went to prison? Is that when he kind of rose up then? Oddly enough, the two of them went to prison together. Okay. Um, they were involved in the same alleged heroin scam, which uh, or he sale, excuse me, which a lot of people thought might have been a setup that uh, this was maybe payback for the hit, a couple of failed hit on Frank Costello on the Upper West Side, you know, where Giganti had shot and missed, right? Right. This one's for you, Frank. He pulls the trigger, it goes through his scalp. And that was, you know, sanctioned by, by Vito. So there was some suggestion that uh, that, that conviction was a setup and a payback for the uh, the attempt on Frank Costello, and I, when I did the book, I, I was able to get some old prison records, um, including like the initial interview where Chin went into prison. He was in Lewisburg, I believe, out in Pennsylvania, and just you know, apropos of nothing, he was very adamant that you know I never dealt any drugs. Now this isn't a document that's at this point 50, 60 years old. There's no reason for him to just. You know, like, oh, I'm somebody's going to see this in the future and this will show that I. So he was he was really very adamant that he he was not guilty of that. But uh, he did the time anyway. What was the whole correlation with Chin and Fat Tony Salerno? Because then Salerno got indicted and then the commission trial happened. What was what's the whole correlation with that? Yeah. Um, Salerno, by the time of the. Uh, of the commission trial was really a straw boss. Okay. Um, I want to say 1981, uh, fat Tony was in, in the hospital. He was uh, ailing and, uh, 
Giganti, with the approval of others in the family, came in and uh, announced that he was now the the Don of of the Genovese family. And uh, Fat Tony agreed. There was a guy named Fish Cafaro who became like uh, Fat Tony's right-hand man, but also a guy who could report to Giganti what was going on. So, I mean, for Giganti, this was great, especially with the commission trial. You know, the federal government doesn't want to say we have the wrong guy. As, mm-hmm. as far as they're concerned, this is the, the head of the family. They have him under indictment. Uh, he's facing, I think he wound up getting 100 years. You know, so in some ways, you know, he was able to skate a little bit longer because of the commission trial. He being, of course, Giganti. What was the issue with Giganti and John Gotti? Because it seemed like them two didn't see eye to eye. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, the biggest issue is Chin Giganti is an old guy, an old school guy. He believes in a certain way of doing things. Uh, that way of doing things does not involve having an Andy Warhol portrait of yourself on the front of Time magazine. Uh, it does not involve uh, dining out on the Upper East Side. Uh, you know, it does not involve putting on big shows at, at your social club headquarters, the Ravenite. I mean, if, if you look at Giganti, he's the head of you know, at a certain point, arguably the most powerful crime family in New York, none of the trappings of wealth, right? He's in a bathrobe. Uh, living with mom. Living with his mother, exactly. He never he never leaves like a 10-square block area. You know, he doesn't go on vacation to Aruba or, you know, he doesn't go back to Italy to visit. He spends all his time... Uh, other than when he started going up to stay with his mistress on the Upper East Side, uh, he spends all his time in this tiny area because to him, the family is is sacrosanct and, you know, he's in charge. He has a responsibility to, one, stay the leader, two, to stay off federal radar, right? I mean, if you're a, if you're an FBI agent in New York, after the Castellano hit, you know, to see Gotti preening around town is is sticking in your craw, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's why, you know, Gotti became, you know, for lack of a better term, right, public enemy number one. And, and they were very intent on getting him. And, uh, you know, they had the wiretaps uh, in the Ravenite where they had Gotti speaking very freely um, you know, Giganti was never caught on wiretaps. His, uh, his social club, the, I believe it was the Triangle Civic Improvement Association, uh, had big signs hanging in there, loose lips, sinks ships, um, you know, guys who were in there knew better than to run their mouths. Um, and of course the that's really the biggest difference between him and Gotti as the two kind of preeminent bosses at the time. One, one never opened his mouth and the other one couldn't shut up. Chin ordered at least one hit, if not several on Gotti. They thought they had him. It was a, a bombing, a car bombing. Yeah. And, uh, they killed Frankie DeChico, the, uh, the Gambino underboss. And there was a guy with Frankie who they thought was Gotti. Uh, but it was not. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, again, no love lost. The chin had no use for him. And uh, Gotti, on the other hand, had a a degree of respect for, for the chin, you know? Um, I don't think anybody ever thought of trying to take him out. That's what's going to be my question, if Gotti ever tried yeah. to take chin out. No, 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 no. I mean, there was a whole thing, even when they, they had a face-to-face meeting, and uh, Gotti said to to Giganti that, uh, you know, John Jr., his son, had, had become a made guy. And Gotti's response was, gee, that's too bad. Like, you know, he did not want his kids to follow him into organized crime. He wanted them to become successful outside of his business, legitimate, you know? Mm-hmm. 
you had mentioned that you had obtained some prison files to put this book together. And you also obtained some files from the FBI as well. Is that correct to put this book together? So there's, there's concrete facts in here. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I interviewed a bunch of people. I interviewed, um, Chin's brother, uh, who is a priest, uh, father Louis Giganti. He's actually, um, when I signed the contract to do the book, I, I reached out to him right away. Um, he was a very uh, high profile guy himself. He was on the city council, very activist priest. He ran a uh, low income housing project up in the Bronx. Um, and he was just a guy. He was always with his brother for court appearances, uh, often wheeling him in in a wheelchair. Uh, and so I, when I when it became clear that I was actually going to be able to write the book after a few years of trying to sell it, I, I reached out to him and uh, he agreed to meet with me. And we met down in Greenwich Village near, you know, near the apartment where the, the whole family lived, had some cannoli and a little coffee. And uh, and we probably spoke for like 45 minutes and he uh I don't think he was thrilled about it, but I think he liked the idea that I went to him and, you know, said to him, this is what I'm hoping to do. He wanted to know why. And, you know, I just sort of argued that if you're if you're looking at New York in the second half of of the 20th century, he's kind of a big figure. in it. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. People, you got to get your hands on this book. Like I said, there'll be a link in the show notes in this as well. 2017, you did The Last Don Standing. And Larry, explain to my listeners what this book's about. Yeah, this book is about uh, Ralph Natale, who uh, was a hitman for the Philadelphia mob. He wound up going to prison for a long time. I'm trying to figure, 14, 15 years. He comes out of prison uh, and he becomes the head of the Philadelphia crime family, which at this point is is in a lot of disarray, uh, right? They had two bosses killed, Angelo Bruno famously blown up, um, you know, and Phil Testa, as Bruce Springsteen says, they blew up the chicken man in Philly last night. <laughs> um, so the family was in a lot of disarray. And when he came out, he was able to, uh, to establish himself as the boss of the family, but he just got hammered with with audio tapes you know i i don't know i i spent god on my 15 20 hours with ralph talking to ralph about it um and yeah i just don't think he thought that that being recorded was so easy you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and so after three years out of jail he goes back to jail you know was he the first ever mob boss to turn states witness Yes. Yes, he was. He was. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that was, I mean, this guy I'm, that I'm going to mention here is still around in Philadelphia. He just was acquitted a couple of years ago at a racketeering trial. Skinny Joey Merlino. Uh, Skinny Joey was Ralph's underboss. And uh, there was a whole thing where the two of them, according to Ralph, had made a pledge that if either one of them went to jail, the other would take care of their family, Ralph's wife and Joey's girlfriend. And uh, when Ralph went back to jail, you know, there was never any kind of payment uh, given to his wife. And this infuriated Ralph and led directly to uh, to his decision to become a federal witness, which he could have become a federal witness back in the 80s. Um, you know, and cut all this time off his sentence, which he refused to do he's a, i mean he's an old school guy it was i mean the difference between the chin book and and the book about ralphie is that i got to meet with ralph so if i had any questions i just asked ralph you know yeah. i would go down go down and visit him and his wife and uh she would make us lunch and uh we would just sit and i'd turn the tape recorder on and talk for an hour an hour and a half we did this every monday for two months month and a half I was going to say, how did you, first off, did you get in touch with him? And it sounds like he was pretty receptive to talking. He, he wanted to do a book. Okay. 
So uh, I don't know how exactly this happened, but he was hooked up with the guy who was my agent for the chin book. The agent was happy with the chin book. They needed someone who could do this right away. Um, they also needed someone who could do it fast because they had an approaching deadline. I think they had had somebody else brought in maybe who didn't uh, hit it off so well with Ralphie. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, it was just, you know, kind of fell in my lap happily. And, uh, actually a funny story. I went down and met with Ralph and, uh, you know, everything goes all right. And it was like a two hour ride to where he was staying from, from where I am in North Jersey. I was supposed to go down the next Monday and, uh, I had a problem with my car, one of my tires. So I call him up and uh, I'm like, Ralph, I can't make it this week. And he's like, I knew you'd never come back. I knew you wouldn't come back. <laughs> I said, I'll be down next Monday. Take it easy. Take it easy. So, uh, you know, I came down the next Monday and he was kind of laughing about it. And, uh, you know, we're still in touch. I call every once in a while just to see how he's doing. He'll call me every once in a while. He's 85, 86 at this point, you know. I got a couple questions in regards to him. He yeah. did he get complete control of the Atlantic City Casino Unions, or was he just, you know, making waves there? Well, I mean, his complaint is that he got cut out of control of the Atlantic City Unions. You know, he was in jail by the time uh, by the time the casinos were really in full gear and the mob was was taking over down there. Um, you know, Ralph. Ralph says he was involved in sort of the, I guess, kind of pre-planning. Like, you know, he was the head of a union down there, which gave him an in. Uh, but by the time that the mob was really able to, you know, reap the big profits from the casinos down there, Ralph was already in jail. He was betrayed by his own guys, and then he turned and testified against them. Why did his own guys turn on him? For him, it's... it's uh, it was a it was a money thing. It was a personal thing. It wasn't uh, it wasn't like they thought the, the first time he went to jail, it was for an arson thing. It really had nothing to do with anything inside the family. They, him and a couple of buddies did a burn down a furniture store. Uh, you know, from some guy owed him money, and you know, how do I get out from under this? Is well, we'll burn your store down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> then you can get some money. We get our money back. Everybody's happy. Um, but the story was, according to Ralph, the story was the same the first time he was assured when he went to prison that time that, uh, his wife would be taken care of and there was no money forthcoming. You know what I mean? So he's in prison. He has no way to earn money. She's at home with the wife and kids. And he was assured that she would be taken care of. And that didn't happen. You know, being a New York guy in New Jersey, been there your whole life, Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. What? what What's the deal with Jimmy Hoffa? Uh, Ralph had a great story. Uh, he and Hoffa were were close, you know. Ralphie ran this union here. And, of course, Hoffa was the, uh, the head of the Teamsters. And uh, they became very friendly. So I want to say this is a week before Hoffa is killed. Uh, he's decided he's going to try and get back in and take over the Teamsters. You know, he's out of prison and uh, he comes to visit Ralph to try and get Ralph's uh, support to run again, you know? And uh, Ralph wants to do it, but he calls Angelo Bruno and uh, Bruno's like, you know, can't happen, Ralph, can't happen. And so Ralph described this whole scene where they're in uh, this at this racetrack restaurant in South Jersey. And uh, I still remember the line. It's in the book. He's, he said uh, that when he embraced Hoffa, there was like the smell of dirt, the smell of death, you know, the smell of a grave. And he knew, uh, you know, he, he knew that Angelo Bruno was not going to approve this. And he knew that this was the last time he was going to see uh, Jimmy Hoffa alive. And does he have any idea what happened to Hoffa? I mean, I think he has guesses, but I don't I don't think anybody I mean at this point, who does know definitively? Yeah. Did, did you see the Irishman? I did. I did. I mean I mean I, I, I personally don't think, you know, 
Sheeran killed him. That's just me. Yes, I agree with you. I you know? agree with you. I read I read the book long before I saw the movie. And uh yeah, I, I just find it hard to believe. I think Sal Bugs is the one that took him out myself. Um, yeah, it makes sense, right? Yeah, it does. But where whatever they ever did with him, who knows? I mean, you've heard everything from he's buried here, buried there, you know, been dumped in acid, put in a barrel, you know, who right. who knows? The whole the thing is he's gone, he's not coming back, and as you said definitively it's almost like JFK. We may never find out. Yeah, I think that's probably right. You know, I, I think of him every time I go into Giant Stadium. He's supposed to be in the end zone, right? <laughs> that's right. Larry, how can people connect with you? Uh, well, you know, you can just go online. I have a Facebook page. Uh, I'm having a little Twitter problem because somebody hacked my account. But, you know, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see that. If you Google me, my stories are in the Daily News constantly. Um, you know, the books are available. All of them are available online. I think Chin is probably still in bookstores. Um, Last On Standing might be as well. So, you know, yeah, I'm easy to find and easy to reach. What's your next project? Uh, We'll see if this works out or not. I've been speaking with um, Otis Anderson, the New York Giants running back, MVP of Super Bowl 25. Yeah. Who's trying to do some sort of a book. So uh, I'm supposed to meet with him and talk to him about that. We were introduced by one of his golfing buddies that I went to college with. Awesome. Well, I hope that works out for you. And Larry, thank you so much for taking time and being on the show today. This has been not only informative and enlightening and fun, but I hope people out there at least, you know, click the links and check out, if not one, you know, maybe all the books. Um, as you can tell, Larry knows what he's talking about. He's done a great deal of, uh, research on this. So Larry, thanks for your time today. Tommy, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. For show notes, go to our website before the lights pod.com. You can get them there under the episode page. Follow us on Instagram before the lights podcast. Thank you for listening to before the lights. And if you'd like to contact us, send me an email before the lights pod at gmail.com. That's before the lights pod at gmail.com. Dot com. Until next time, everybody, I'm Tommy Canale. A salute. A chin chin. <laughs>